Hello, everybody. We have an energy deindustrialization going on in Germany. But is it coming to the United States very quickly? But yet, let's also take a look. Why is it that the energy consumers, the energy that consumers are paying since 2005 to now has gone up? And in California, it has doubled. But yet we've had 15 percent increase of wind and solar from that same time period. Is it related or in Arkansas, are they related and married to each other? I'm not real sure, but I've got two fantastic guys that are stopping by the podcast today. Let me give an introduction to the Energy Bad Boys. I mean, they're on Substack and you've got to follow them and support them. I have Mitch Rowling and I mean, he is on here and he's been dominating the conversation as we just started it. Mitch, thank you for stopping by today. Thank you so much for having us. Boy, that's the most you've said in our entire conversation. <laughs> All right. And then also his buddy and his partner, Isaac Orr. Isaac, thank you for stopping by today. Yeah, happy to be here. I can't wait to begin to find out because you guys are rock stars. You've got a balance in your uh, how you've got your plan working and your good buddies with Robert Bryce. Uh, I love Robert. He's been on the podcast three times and uh, you guys have got a great sub stack. Tell us how you got started. Well, uh, Mitch and I have been working at Center of the American Experiment, which is a uh, policy think tank in Minnesota for the last several years. So uh, that's where we have been doing the yeoman's share of our, our work in energy and it was like, what, five months ago, Mitch Doomberg quoted us in one of his articles. I think it was debunking the levelized cost of energy. And after that, it was like, OK, this is the sign we've been waiting for, because Mitch and I had been kind of kicking the tires on Substack for a while. Uh, I remember in May, we we're like, OK, what's the name of our what's the name of our uh, Substack going to be? And we're like, OK, Energy Bad Boys. That's cool. Uh, and they're like, what's our logo going to be? So we thought about it for a while and we're like, we definitely want it to be a fork inside of an electrical socket. So uh, <laughs> after after Doomberg uh, retweeted us, we uh, put up this article that we had written for Center of the American Experiments quarterly magazine, Thinking Minnesota, called Enjoy the Blackouts, Jack. And, you know, that was very well received. It really helped that Doomberg uh, restacked us on the platform and has been very uh, supportive of our our efforts so far. So uh, it's been a really fun ride. We've been going since I think it was November twelfth. Uh, we we posted that, and as of today, we've almost got uh, twenty six hundred subscribers. So it's been it's been a fun ride, and uh, we're looking forward to keeping it going. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. And so, um, Mitch, uh, what do you, what have you got going on on that? So you're the data dude. Yep. Yep. We both, we both write, but I do more of the, you know, digging for the bodies, uh, uncovering stuff and, and <laughs> data filings and whatnot, what most people would consider the boring work, but I seem to have fun with it. Uh, I would do it on my free time. So lucky I get paid for it. Um, you know, I, I like to uncover what they're not telling on the front page of, of a lot of these filings. So, you know, I really enjoy it. Okay. Um, I'm telling you, uh, this is kind of fun because I just interviewed Doomberg with Chris Wright, CEO of, uh, Liberty Energy. I love Chris Wright. Absolutely a great human. And then Doomberg, this is my third interview uh, it's probably my third with chris as well too and then my third uh interview with doomberg and i love doomberg and it's so cool that he's got the reach he's like the number one in energy and finance out there mm -hmm. and you guys are, are really growing as well so humor wins doesn't it yeah yeah that and you know one of the things uh, that I always try to do when I'm writing an article is I just stick with the mantra don't make me think Right. So uh, the thing that I want, I want to write an article in such Don't a way. Make me think. Yes. So I want to <laughs> write an article in a way where the, the, the reader just intuitively understands what we are trying to convey. I do not want every time a, a reader has to sit and say, well, I don't know if I quite understand what that means. That's a friction point. And that is probably a point where they're going to lose interest in the article or they can get frustrated. So 
Uh, what we specialize in is boiling down very complicated concepts and hopefully explain it in a way that people yep. just kind of get it, right? We use analogies that kind of just, it just clicks. And ultimately, energy is a very uh, opaque and it can be very complicated uh, subject matter. So what we right. want to do is we want to bring this to the masses, which is why, you know, we're really proud of the articles that we've just written on the website, the green plating, the grid article and yes. the deindustrialization article. Uh, so, you know, this doesn't have to be opaque and complicated, but a lot of the stakeholders that are in this industry, whether it's the utilities or the lawmakers, the public utility commissioners or the environmental groups, they want to make this seem so overwhelming that normal people cannot participate. They're basically trying to gatekeep the conversation. And we're saying, no, that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, you know, I, I love it from a uh, sitting back and, and looking at the amount of content that my team puts out. You know, I'm, I'm including uh, Irina Slav uh, on the podcast, Tammy Nemeth, David Blackman, Ray Trevino, Michael Tanner and myself and we and the doctor, we get we get this stuff out here. But you guys, I love your methodology and uh uh mitchell how you phrase digging up the bodies you know uh i'm sorry that you got some talent you two have a good working relationship have you all known each other since kindergarten <laughs> well actually we've known each other since i became an intern at the the center of the american experiment so that was what march 2018 i came in and i think yeah, six I, years you, yeah so you you actually were hired right around that time too um and so i was an intern and Isaac was the pretty much the only one that utilized me and it just became a working pair, you know, since then. And yeah, we really have complimented each other. You know, like we said, I, I dig up the bodies. We're both writers, but Isaac puts that, you know, don't make me think flare onto it and right. it worked well. You know, and, and understanding where I'm at, you know, as far as, as uh, really trying to focus on, ending energy poverty through the delivering the lowest kilowatt per hour to everyone on the planet uh, by delivering sustainable uh, energy, fiscally responsible energy without printing money and having the least amount of impact on the environment. Everybody kind of shakes their head. Oh yeah, that's exactly right. And then you start mentioning, oh, wait a minute, wind and solar are a, uh, you know, incapable of doing that. And they're a money grab and, you know, you start and they're not recyclable and, and all this other kind of stuff. You guys nailed it with the grid on the green plating. And I was like, I got to get you guys on the podcast. I saw that. And I was like, I want to make sure that you get your story out here because you articulated it better than I could have. Well, that's great. Should we talk about that piece then? Absolutely. Okay, uh, cool. What were, um, uh, because uh, the uh, also uh, this goes hand in hand with your other one, yes. which is deindustrialization of Germany, which is happening intentionally. And that's a whole other geopolitical thing that I've been talking to folks all over the world about. And let's go ahead and kick off. What were you thinking? Yeah, yeah. So I think the most important thing for a lot of your listeners to understand is that vertically integrated monopoly utility companies, which is the, the model for most of the country, right? There are very, there's a handful of states that have a more competitive, um, you know, they've de, I guess they've destructured or unstructured the generation of right. uh, electricity, but most states from that we've seen or worked in have still been pretty much vertically integrated. And those are not really private companies. They are government approved monopoly utilities. Mm, and yeah. those- yeah, and that's what it is. Like, I think conservatives need to understand that the utility company is not a private company. It is this monopoly that's created by the government, and it has the exclusive right to sell electricity in its service territory. So there can be no competition. So uh, all competition will be squelched. Um, so uh, it would be unfair to allow the utility company to charge whatever they want for electricity because there's no competition, right? So the right. price of electricity in these areas is set by regulators, government regulators at right. the Public Service Commission, Public Utilities Commission, whatever it's called. And it uses a formula called the cost of service formula. And okay. people's eyes always glaze over whenever you say formula, but stay with me, people. It's actually pretty <laughs> simple. 
Uh, it says for, for our podcast listeners, uh, Isaac, I just want to say Mitch's eyes started glowing when you said formula and bait. <laughs> and I, I mean, he started almost purring. So anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. He loves it. He went to, <laughs> he's got his master's in finance. So he's like, uh, yes, the formula. Uh, <laughs> so he's just the mad scientist in his lab. And, um, anyway, this formula says that a utility company can charge enough for its electricity to cover the cost of providing service to everybody, plus a 10% profit whenever they build something new. And that new expansion, that new construction is approved by the regulator, right? So yep. this gives utility companies a powerful incentive to build as new, as much new stuff as the regulator will let them get away with. And on the other end of this equation is depreciation. So every year, a utility pays off a power plant uh, a little bit more. Think about like when you're paying off a mortgage every every month, every year, you're paying off less interest and more principal. Uh, so once this asset is completely depreciated, uh, it is providing the lowest cost, most reliable electricity on the grid, but it is no longer creating a profit for the utility because its book value is technically zero, even though it's a great asset. It's the best asset for the rate payer. So we have, go ahead, Stu. Yeah, yeah, rate payer, but you know, you sit back and kind of go, it's financial and uh, the rate payer is always getting it in the drive-through as Joe Pesci said, you know, <laughs> in, uh, you know, Lethal Weapon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what's happening now is uh, utilities have a, a strong incentive to be as inefficient as possible when it comes to how they spend money, as long as the regular says, a regulator says it's okay. And uh, many times the regulator is perfectly happy to approve new wind, solar, battery storage, what have you, and to close down the coal plants. So uh, wind and solar are the inefficiencies that utility companies are looking for. And the fact that wind and solar don't work very well is an incredible bonus because every time you shut down a coal plant, you are able to replace it with probably an equivalent amount of wind. So let's just say 10 megawatts. This is what we said in our piece, right? right. We said you shut down a 10 megawatt coal plant, you're able to build 10 megawatts of wind, 10 megawatts of solar, and then 10 megawatts of natural gas, because there will inevitably be a period where you need all 10 megawatts of natural gas in order to back up that wind and solar. <clears throat> so you've essentially tripled the size of the grid, tripled your cash outlay, for uh, new generation and the utility is making tons of profits. And I don't know, Mitch, do you want to elaborate on the kinds of profits that we're talking about? Cause it's billions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's billions and it's company after company that's doing it too. And they've grown at a wow. massive scale to the point where Morningstar has suggested that, you know, the utility industry is now a growth industry when it was supposed to, you know, be kind of a slow and steady industry. Oh, yeah. And it was Travis Miller in there that was that was in the in the Morningstar piece that was talking about, yeah, you know, this is the best growth uh, uh, environment that we've seen utilities have in a while. And it's because of electrification, EVs and clean energy goals. And we didn't say it in the piece, but Travis Miller goes on to say that in the states where they're less likely to approve rate increases, this growth environment doesn't exist. And so growth environment exists where you can improve, approve rate increases and do your clean energy goals, but not where they're not going to approve that stuff. So you kind of put two and two together, wow. what's causing yeah. rate increases. Um, it's, it's these utility profits that are just skyrocketing. And we look at Excel, DT Energy, DTE Energy, uh, APS and uh, We Energies. Yeah, in Arizona Public Service. We Energies is in Wisconsin. Uh, DTE is in Detroit. Right. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, Arizona. Now, do they are they the ones maintaining the nuclear facility yes. out there? Yeah, because. I've been through that nuclear facility and it's pretty darn cool. I mean, still it's. Oh yeah. We love nuclear. And uh, yeah, one of the reasons we love it is because the plants last for 80 years. Right? right. So when we're thinking about the perpetual cash machine that wind and solar are for these utilities, a wind turbine lasts maybe 20 years. A lot of them are being repowered after only 10 or 11. Uh, we write about that on our Substack stack too. Uh, it's in an article called a death of a wind farm. So it's, 
so and solar panels only last for 25 years so let, you could let me build, throw yeah go let ahead. me throw this squirrel at you uh your points are dead on right and i want to i want to jump in here because i get excited and i'm a ha- yeah. hyperactive rat child okay <laughs> Um, I found that the wind farms are fiscally unsustainable from day one without injections from tax incentives slash same thing. Warren Buffett said, don't invest in a wind farm unless it's got tax subsidies. Now, everybody said 20 years, 30 years, blah, 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 blah. Back that number back down to eight. Eight seems to be the meantime between failure and warranty repairs six seems to be where it really starts coming in and when the rates can't get approved you guys nailed it i didn't articulate it well so far and that is in that eight year mark they start revamping it like robert bryce said that they're coming back in and saying hey they're they're applying for funds from the porculus bill as Dan Bongino calls the Info, in, uh, inf- Inflation Reduction Act and then the Infrastructure Bill, which both have a bunch of crap in it. So then they come back and do that, even that on that eight-year mark and that six-year mark. It is graft. It is uh, terrible. It is stealing. It is, and nobody, I haven't been able to figure out the future cost of money formula and uh, Mitchell you're going to love this one when you sit back and I got my MBA billions of years ago I couldn't remember a single formula possible um, and, and and so what is the dollar amount that this bloated uh, porculous bill going back around to these utilities having on our uh, national budget and the inflation to the consumers and the rate so if we're at a ballpark 20 you can see where i'm going with this right am i uh, so we're at a 20 percent inflation under biden economics you know biden economics when you're talking food and everything else right what is our national debt gonna do to us that is directly impacted by the high cost of energy and you look at california i'm having a data dump right now you know guys and so california is at a hundred percent increase in, in electricity rates from 2005 to 2022 i believe is what the epa uh just put out and so either that or you guys did i'm stealing the information from everywhere so (laughs) yeah and so you can see where i'm going with this i want to know we don't know how bad it is is that a fair statement did i just go off the rails and totally miss the boat uh no i I mean you're right yeah it's it's gonna be bad we don't know how bad (laughs) (laughs) travis fisher from cato says that we're going to be spending three trillion dollars or up to three trillion dollars on wind and solar subsidies through 2050 uh because you know in the inflation production act they said uh that the it was something along the lines of these subsidies will last until 2032 or until our targeted co2 reduction goals are met which mm-hmm. effectively could make this these subsidies permanent, right? So that was it one of the be. things. Well, right, yes. Uh, <laughs> so that was that's one of the things that he talks about a lot. Is this is essentially an uncapped spending bill? Uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully we have a complete change of the guard when it comes to uh, who's in office. Uh, you know, after November. And because they passed this through reconciliation, you can repeal that pretty easily in theory. Uh, but we need you know, conservatives in the legislature, free marketers in the legislature to have the, the fortitude, uh, you right. can, you can insert whatever body part you want in front of fortitude, uh, in order to repeal these, uh, <laughs> repeal these, these subsidies. And many times it's been, uh, folks from the great plains, like Senator Grassley, who have championed the wind production tax credit. So, you know, there, there ultimately needs to be a recognition in, conservative circles for policymakers that the subsidies that we've been providing for wind and solar are actively undermining the reliability of the electric grid. And this isn't a cute little gimme or pet project for your state anymore. This is an existential threat to the con- or the country's competitiveness when it comes to manufacturing, mining, you name it. Right. Like if we want to be a global superpower, we can't keep subsidizing energy sources that do not work well. 
No, and you guys are just nailing it right down the park on, on that. And, you know, it's kind of like I didn't learn enough about the grid until I read the book Shorting the Grid by uh, Meredith Angwin. I love Meredith. She is a, a national treasure speaking about the grid and stability and, and everything else. And so, I, you know, the balancing authorities and exactly what you guys are preaching and talking about you know, you have another great resource out there, the Meredith Angwin of the world. And have you guys seen the, you know, uh, juice, the series.com by Robert Bryce. Yep. Uh, uh, he's pretty cool when he got that bad dog thrown out there, didn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Robert's a bad man. Uh, I, I, I love that bad man. You guys, oh, me are, too. I uh, mean, uh, bad man in the most, uh, flattering well, way possible consider you got a way cool podcast called the energy bad boys i <laughs> my first thought was uh uh bad boys too uh you guys you know have got i know you've probably seen that right mm -hmm. bad boys too with uh um Mar uh i think it's martin and um oh what's his Bill name Smith. yeah thank you martin Bill lawrence Martin's, yeah 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 um yep. All right. Now, when you guys were dating, uh, did the did your father, uh, the father of the girl that you guys were ever dating, show up like Will Smith's uncle when he pretended to, you know, shoot the kid and uh, get out of the way, kid? Oh, you know, no. I, I, mean, I, I promised know. myself I would be that father when I. <laughs> 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 yeah. I think Will Smith. That was one of Will Smith's greatest movies, yeah. as far as I was concerned. I mean, you know, I I don't care if he's socially adept anymore i don't watch any any hollywood what's next for your stories what do you see coming around the corner for you guys right now yeah uh well this week we're working on another piece that is our solution to utility green plating uh we've oh, nice. been working on this legislation called the only pay for what you get act for a few years it's been our pet idea and ultimately uh we nice. yeah so um we we want rate payers to be protected from paying for the full cost of an asset regardless of whether that asset shows up when you need the power most so um how can i help <laughs> well i mean we're talking about it right now and yeah, the listeners right are now. getting well i guess the piece will be out by the time the podcast is released so um so yeah, check out uh, How to Stop Utility Green Plating, the only pay for what you get act on the Energy Bad Boys Substack. Uh, it will be published uh, probably uh, March 16th is is probably the day you can look for on that. Um, okay. But uh, Mr. Producer, I got to be an arrogant bonehead. Let's get this out before that. I'm just kidding. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, this uh, is fantastic. Yeah, so... Um, you know, we have Excel Energy in Minnesota, and we have friends in Colorado that also deal with Excel, and they are the worst when it comes to green plating their grids. Uh, they wow. run TV commercials talking about how electricity will be affordable moving forward, low cost, but they always decline to define what that means. So they use these ambiguous weasel words, and they basically lie to people, and they have these stupid commercials that drive me crazy, and every time I see one, I'm like, I'm going to get them. Uh, so, uh, Mitch and I were thinking, what legislation could we propose that would anger Excel the most? So we came up with only pay for what you get. So, uh, grid planners, regardless of whether that is a utility commission or a regional transmission organization, right? RTO, nice. uh, have, uh, they basically give different capacity value or reliability values to assets based on their performance during times of peak electricity demand, right? So this is called a capacity accreditation or capacity value. You can use all of these terms basically interchangeably. Um, right. So uh, thermal resources, coal, natural gas, and nuclear get high values. It's generally anywhere between 85 and 95% capacity value. Uh, nuclear is at the high end. Gas is usually at the lower end because there's right. been more outages uh, during, you know, like Winter Storm Elliot or Yuri. Uh, but wind and solar always get pretty low values. So uh, I've just been looking at this for this piece right now. And you have uh, a lot of times solar will get a fairly high capacity value in the summertime because the time, the hours when solar is producing a lot 
coincide with the hours of the highest electricity demand in the summertime. But in right. the wintertime, uh, it gets like a 6% capacity value uh, because the days are short. Here in Minnesota, the panels are frequently covered in snow and even in the South, right? So let's look right. at uh, North Carolina, which, you know, maybe that's the mid-Atlantic, but we're from Wisconsin and Minnesota. So anything below Mason-Dixon is the South to us. And um, <laughs> so uh, in, in North Carolina during Winter Storm Elliott, electricity demand peaked at night when it was cold and solar was producing zero megawatts right so right. uh as if we are forced to electrify home heating or or transportation we are going to switch from summer peaking systems to winter peaking systems so uh, we need to think wow. about that moving forward so under our legislation uh you know we would probably average it out uh, so if a utility company wants to build a solar panel, that's okay, but you can right. only recover, let's say 22% or 25% of that cost from ratepayers, and the remaining 75% of that um, capacity value or that asset would have to be paid by some other means, probably shareholders, right? So right. this is our way of introducing some market signals into a utility planning process that basically doesn't have any, right? Um, so same for wind. Uh, wind in MISO in the summertime gets an 18% capacity accreditation. Right. Uh, so you get to recover 18% of your costs from ratepayers. And if you want to build it and put stupid TV commercials on the television, you can, but your shareholders are going to be on the hook for this, this asset. I love everything that you just said. Here's where, here's where we're in. we're we're in for a, a really big bet. Do you have a sponsor politically that likes your idea yet? Well, that's uh, you, you eat an elephant one step at a time, Stu. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I I think that we can probably find some. Um, okay, let's let's do this one step at a time. Let's get it published. Let's get it out there. I want to help get a sponsor, and let's talk this bad dog up. Yep. You know, we seem to be using bad boys, bad dog, uh, bad everything, bad Robert's a brat, uh, bad dude. Um, <laughs> let's get us a bad dog sponsor. That's right. Uh, for this and, and really try to carry this forward because I quite honestly don't believe this is so cool. And I don't believe that the current, uh, department of energy folks would actually let the lobbyists uh, even get a hold of this. I, I don't think this would get past the lobbyists, to be honest with you. Oh, no, uh, absolutely not. So, uh, <laughs> and the thing is, uh, we want this to get past. Well, we got to try. Levels. We do. Absolutely. 100%. So we think that this is a most applicable at a state level for legislation. So uh, any state lawmakers who are listening and you say, this is a great idea. We have draft legislation that we can you know, send to you if you want to introduce it, you know, talk to your colleagues That's about huge. it. Uh, so we already have that. Um, so uh, it, it's generally the, the problem here is that the utility companies in many states are among the top lobbyists in the entire uh, ecosystem there. Like yep. in Minnesota, it's frequently Excel Energy, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and then, you know, a few others, right? <laughs> so you have one company that lobbies more than the entity that's responsible for lobbying for all of the businesses in the state. So right. uh, they have extreme political power. And in blue states, the utilities basically are buddy buddy with the lawmakers there because like, oh, no, don't don't force us to spend a whole bunch of money and increase our corporate profits. That would be terrible. Right. So uh, they they are basically they say they're neutral on a lot of these mandates for uh, more wind and solar, but you know, on the back end, they're counting their money. Uh, and then they say things in committee, like we're neutral, but we are excited about this opportunity to decarbonize our grid. And, you know, I, so they go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry. I get excited. And, yeah. I'm, uh, uh, do you see that, uh, ERCOT may have a little bit of a different opinion on this? So, uh, ERCOT, we haven't looked at that. So I know the public okay. utilities of tax or commission of Texas is, getting involved in this issue. Our friend Brent Bennett down at Texas Public Policy Foundation keeps a closer nice. eye on this stuff. 
uh, than we do, but we're always happy to help Brent out if he ever needs it. And he's been incredibly generous with his time with, with us too, whenever we write about Texas. Maybe we do a little seminar with him and a webinar, live webinar, get this thing rolling and try to help him out. What do you think? Yeah. So in Texas, it's going to be tough because, uh, in ERCOT, there is basically an unlimited ability for new entrants to come into the market, and they don't need any permission. So in the vertically re or integrated states, if a utility company wants to build something new, they need to right. go get permission from the regulator. And right. there is no barrier to entry in ERCOT in order to do that. If you wanted to talk about the panhandle, uh, where Excel Energy also operates and may or may not have <laughs> been responsible for a large smokehouse fire. Uh, we'll see. Uh, they deny any negligence. There, there are so, other conspiracy theories that we won't go into on this one. But yeah, yeah, and we don't we don't yeah. need to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes! <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, like we think that this is best at a, a state level, and uh, we think that we. I think it'll it'll go a long way towards encouraging people to build things that are reliable, durable assets, and uh, that's that's what we need. We need as much reliable, affordable, and long lasting power plants on the grid as possible. That's why Mitch and I say, look, these coal plants that we're shutting down have decades of useful life on them, and we need more power. I mean, if we're going to be reshoring uh, manufacturing, if we're going to have data centers and all that stuff, you can't close these down and keep the lights on. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and we sit back in uh, Monday on the energy realities, uh, the team from uh, Irina Slav, Tammy Namath, and David Blackman and I are going to be talking about the resurgence of natural gas around the world, just the sheer number of natural gas and the EIA coming back out and saying the only reason that we dropped our uh, gas outputs is the retiring of the coal and the increased uh, of the natural gas plants, but yet we can't get a damn pipeline uh, permitted within eight hours of the, you know, the Marcellus up there and they're importing LN, you know, LNG from Russia, you know, and a few other nefarious places into Boston. You can't buy this kind of entertainment as an energy writer <laughs> right now. Yeah. And Boston deserves it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I knew I liked you guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, fantastic. I'll tell you, you know, we've got so much to talk about again, and I, I can't wait to have a long, a longer relationship with you guys and trying to help share your word out there and get your story out there. Cause you guys are knocking it out of the park. So, uh, you know, uh, Mitchell, what's coming around the corner for you personally? Personally, well, I, I'm really excited about the the sub stack and I, I, I just really like growing that. Uh, I like digging into everything. You know, that's really been on my mind first and foremost, besides my my job at the center. So I, uh, you know, that's coming around. We have another great piece coming around about uh, the intermittency, the level S cost of intermittency. So that's going to be a fun oh, one too. Nice. We won't do that one. So just keep an eye out for it. But we, we have some fun stuff coming up. Cool. How about you, Isaac? What's coming around the corner for you personally? Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to go professional first and then personal. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we're helping we're helping the state of North Dakota model the impact of different EPA regulations on reliability nice. and affordability. And, you know, that is going to be so we're it's the North Dakota Transmission Authority has been a great partner for us. Uh, Mitch and I joke we're the unofficial energy modelers of the state at this point. Right. And they're going to use the analysis that we're doing, and they're probably going to be using it to sue for a stay on the mercury and air toxic standards. And we're talking about uh, potentially doing this for the new CO2 regulations as well. Uh, we did it on the original version of the Clean Power Plan 2.0, and nice. I think we're going to do it for this next one. So that's going to be great. I mean, I think that that is a, it's a really exciting opportunity for us uh, at American Experiment to be involved in this uh, high stakes litigation and yeah, you know, we're the we're the expert witnesses. So that's that's really cool. cool. Um, yeah, and then personally, it's you know summertime in Minnesota. It's the best time to be here. Uh, do you do any uh, fishing for walleye up there? Or? No, I, I grew up on a farm, so I'm more of a farmer than a fisher. 
Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like every time I go by a cow, cow truck hauling them, I smell money. And, yeah. and so once you're on a farm, you, you have a whole different smell. I, I smell uh, work, but you can smell money if you want to. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, how do people find you guys? Yeah, you can check us out at AmericanExperiment.org. And uh, I'm on I'm on Twitter. I refuse to call it X. Um, like uh, <laughs> my OK, so here's the thing. I grew up on a, the same same house. My grandpa was born in in 1930 on a, nice. a small dairy farm. Right. And like all of the different fields that we farm have names associated with them, like Hey, can you run a sandwich down to dad's? He's on Mortensons, right? Yep. And uh, Mortensons have not owned that field in my lifetime, but we still call it Mortensons, right? So if the field <laughs> changes hands, we don't change the name of the field. And that's how I feel about Twitter. Uh, so you can yep. you can find me at the fracking guy on Twitter. And Mitch, you're on you're on Twitter as well. What's your handle? Yep, I'm at Mitch Rowling, but I'm also active on LinkedIn. Uh, mm, Mitch mm -hmm. same thing, yep. so. Yep. And sounds, of course, Energy Bad Boys on Substack. Exactly. I'll tell you, we will have all of those in the show notes. And uh, I can't wait to visit with you guys again and uh, look forward to it. So thank you so much for making the time today. Yeah, oh, this is it. super fun. Have us on anytime. Yeah. I hope this was the worst podcast you were ever on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys.